I've had sort of a love-hate relationship with Quine. I've been kind of cranky about him for a long time, but actually since rereading him in preparation for this episode, I think I've started to get a sense of where he's coming from. I will try to be charitable in my presentation of stuff. How long ago was the Frigga episode? Oh, wow. Uh, when was that? It was like a year ago, wasn't it? Or more? more it was a year and, and a half. Yeah, year a year and, and a half, half ago. Because a year ago, I was uh, over in Europe. <laughs> yeah, well, how was that? What were you doing there? Oh, it was great. It was fantastic. Yeah, I was visiting at this uh, cool research institute called the Institute for Logic, Language, and Computation in Amsterdam, which is uh, this like really mm. interdisciplinary place where like philosophers, linguists, mathematicians, cognitive scientists, uh, they all like teach courses together, write papers together, take courses together. I've never seen anything so interdisciplinary. So that's very much up my alley. I like dissolving boundaries between disciplines. Amsterdam, huh? Yeah, yeah. And you were dissolving some boundaries over there? <laughs> uh, yeah. And how is your podcast going, Elucidations? It's great. Um, yeah, we've recorded a bunch of new interviews now. Um, I've gotten some European folks on who are going to be um, peopling the podcast over the next few months. Some pretty exciting folks. Uh, we just released an interview with uh, Johan von Bentham, which was really cool, I thought. And uh, yeah, now back in Chicago, interviewing more Chicago people. Well, I see on your page, man, a graying Nicholas Asher who taught all of the rest of us logic at UT. Oh, that's right. Yeah, yeah I forgot. You have the Asher connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does he still wear the tight jeans? <laughs> I didn't notice. <laughs> <laughs> tight jeans, eh? He was known for yeah, that at UT. I, nothing jumped out at me. Would you get in trouble if you <laughs> did notice and said something on this podcast? <laughs> yeah, I don't get the sense that he is an avid podcast listener. I think we're probably safe yeah. making um, comments about his fashion choices. I don't see any giant full-length pictures on his website here. <laughs> yeah, he, he was a great guy. You, you were absolutely right. He is one of the nicest guys. As uh, boring as symbolic logic, modal logic might seem... He was the guy to teach it. Yeah, I mean, he was there for a long time, too, I think, before he moved to this computer science uh, research institute in Toulouse, where he is now. He probably would have had a different perspective, I think, on modal logic than a lot of people. His perspective is sort of more interdisciplinary and influenced by computer science and whatnot, whereas like a lot of modal logic classes sort of just teach the philosopher's version of it. We do stuff like the uh, modal logic proof for the existence of God and stuff like that. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I've heard there is a massive literature on that stuff. Anselm translated into S5 and so forth. Yes. And just to be provocative, let's just dismiss all of that as a load of crap right now. <laughs> officially. It is officially dismissed as a load of crap. Yeah. Perhaps eventually we'll do some of it. <laughs> if we go a little farther in American analytic philosophy, then we will get to David Lewis, who is the captain of modal logic. I'm just going to state for the record right now, out. <laughs> Not on vacation. That. That's really pushing On the it. physically unable to prepare list, you name it. Not interested. Well, next time we have a highly, uh, it's not actually that technical. It's certainly not any more technical than the Russell on math one that we did, but it's a giant logical constructive system by Carnap, who was Quine's, really his idol. Quine said that Carnap was like the most important philosopher of the 20th century. And the, what we are reading today is a direct reaction. And then Quine responds to him and he responds to Quine and so on. Carnap was about 18 years older than Quine when Quine, uh, so Quine is from Ohio. He was just brilliant, really liked the uh, Principia Mathematica, and got to go to Cambridge, I believe, to work ostensibly under Whitehead, got his PhD in two years, and then just got to meet meet all the greats that were there at the time, including Carnap, who was a student of Frege, and uh, I read where he said he tried to get hold of Wittgenstein while he's over there, but Wittgenstein did not answer his letter. <laughs> so sad. Huh. The Ohio thing is interesting. I um, Is it right that he went to Oberlin for undergrad? Did I remember? He did go to Oberlin. David Lewis was the uh, son of uh, two Oberlin professors. That's another interesting Quine-Lewis connection. Lewis was uh, one of Quine's students. And, um, but anyway, let's not, we don't want to drive Seth away already. Um. I know that Pat Churchland and Owen Flanagan, who were both on our episodes, were big sort of disciples. They really were in the Quinean mode. Yeah. That is, of trying to make philosophy continuous with science. So Quine did not see philosophy as a foundational discipline to set up science in some way. But it was about clarifying what science is doing, clarifying the ontological commitments, like when you make a scientific theory, what kind of objects are you claiming are out there, getting clear on the relationship between science and math, etc. But he was a self-proclaimed naturalist, which we don't get into in these essays that much into what that actually means. I mean, he has all these essays later, like epistemology naturalized, that perhaps we could someday look at. But here we kind of have to read into the particular theses he's arguing for here. He considered 
philosophy or branch of science. He considered it completely continuous based upon the, just the two essays we read. In fact, I was trying to find the quote where he says exactly that. Yeah, so that's certainly where, personally, I feel his influence the most these days is among contemporary naturalists who think that philosophy has no special subject matter, but it's completely continuous with science, as Dylan just said, and there's no methodology that's proper to philosophy, as it's seen from science. There's no facts in the world that are kind of only uncoverable via philosophical methods. Anything that really gets to count as a fact has to be something that is discoverable via natural scientific methods. His conception of science, though, is pretty broad. It's not just based on hard physics or something, like he considers history a part of science. Yeah, he says science is a continuation of common sense. And also we get some very suggestive statements at the end of the Two Dogmas of Empiricism essay where he calls the positing of physical objects myths and compares them to gods. Homer's gods. Uh, Another thing I think is interesting that's maybe missing from contemporary Aquinians is the close link he sees between logic and science. A lot of people who are influenced by Aquine today might, for example, investigate morality by doing empirical psychology, but logic somehow seems never to enter into the equation the way it always does for Aquine. I, mean, I guess the reason for that is that he sees science in its purest, most ideal form as happening in the most austere possible logical language that you can come up with. It's not necessarily the first thing you'd think of when you think of like, oh, what does the biologist do? Well, they do logic. Right. I mean, that could have been sort of just the trend as of the 40s and 50s, but yeah. he certainly kept that throughout his career and he lived until 2000. Yeah, the collection that these two essays are in, they're the first two essays that I have, is from a logical point of view, nine logical philosophical essays from 1953 originally. So, you know, a lot of that has to do with the Carnap influence, right, from Frege and Russell. In fact, Quine started, like some of these other guys, as a math guy. So it was math and then philosophy of mathematics as sort of his secondary focus. So everything started with that, even though it seems strange from, I don't know, at least what I as a non-mathematician think that mathematicians would be interested in. It seems like it's a fairly natural movement. Well, especially at the time when Quine was around, Quine and Russell and those guys around at a time of upheaval in the foundations of mathematics. Gettle's theorem is the 1930s. Russell's paradox is a little before that. All these attempts by Hilbert and these metamathematical trends trying to found mathematics within mathematics, which ultimately concludes with Gettle's theorem of showing that you can't have a complete and consistent account of arithmetic. So that's all a very philosophical bend of mathematics. Right. So that pretty much struck down the thing that Russell and Whitehead were trying to do in Principia Mathematica, which is what we summed up in our Philosophy of Mathematics episode. We had read a Russell sort of shortened, dumbed down version of that, where he just shows the foundation of basic arithmetic in logic. That was the starting point for Aquine's thinking, that he really liked all the proofs in that book, but he thought that the text surrounding it was kind of sloppy and inelegant, and he wanted the ontology. He thought it was very wasteful. It was very ontologically profligate. There are all these just extra entities all over the place that then in Carnap continued that trend, at least according to Quine's analysis. Whereas Quine, just like if you were doing regular natural science, you don't want to posit extra types of entities if you don't need to. So he certainly was of the bent that if he could only talk about physical things and not talk about irreducibly mental objects, he was definitely in favor of that. This was also the heyday of behaviorism. He even saw John Watson, sort of the big founder of behaviorism, took a course from him and was pals with B.F. Skinner, another big behaviorist at the time. So was very much in favor, as was Carnap, in trying to reduce the complexities of whatever field you're looking at into as sparse a base as possible. Can we talk about that for a second? Sure. Who yeah. cares? Who gives a shit how many entities there are, why there's so many or so few? Why is that important? It's a good question. It's one I ask myself a lot. A lot of philosophers, especially metaphysicians, are worried about cluttering the universe with too many different kinds of things. So my own temperament is fairly ontologically promiscuous myself. So my inclination is to say, yeah, whatever, you know, sure. Well, let's look at what Quine says. He explicitly takes this on, right? He uses, in fact, if it isn't the word profligate, he uses something like that in the first essay. I believe the word is promiscuous. Okay. It's not uncommon for philosophers to use metaphors that involve sexual connotations. I just want to point <laughs> that out. Yeah. We want to penetrate, get to the truth. Plato's beard. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Plato's beard. I like that. <laughs> Let me see if I can find that passage, uh, but the Desert Landscapes passage. Page three. Here we go. Quine is referring in On What There Is to the philosopher, we'll call him Wyman. Wyman's overpopulated universe is in many ways unlovely. It offends the aesthetic sense of those of us who have a taste for desert landscapes. But this is not the worst of it. Wyman's slum of possibilities is a breeding ground for disorderly elements. And then he goes on to talk about a fat man in a doorway. This is the answer to your question, right? It's aesthetically unpleasing? Well, I think it's partly that and it leads to confusion from his point of view. There becomes a muddle of whether or not you have two things or one thing because you have given entity status to this huge array of cases. Maybe you should rewind a little bit and... Yeah. Let's say what this Plato's beard Plato's thing is beard, because yeah. I, I think, you know, uh, some of our listeners might read this and wonder why it is that someone thought that the term Pegasus had to refer to anything. It seems kind of absurd to say that you need an entity for Pegasus. So let's say what motivates them. In the very beginning, he presents this question of this old platonic riddle of non-being. Non-being yeah. must in some sense be. Otherwise, what is it that there is not? This tangled doctrine might be nicknamed Plato's beard. And so, he begins with this question of non-being and tries to say it's just a silly problem. So, let's say what that means. Non-being must in yeah. some sense be otherwise. You know, I like Quine has a great style, but it's very dense and I don't think he really fully spells this out for a newbie. So, <laughs> you take a sentence like Pegasus has wings or Pegasus doesn't exist. You could take either one of those sentences. And the intuitive idea is that in order for it to have meaning, the term Pegasus has to be about something. It has to refer. That in some sense, meaning depends on reference. Yeah, has to refer. And so that aboutness suggests that there's some entity to which it refers. And so what Quine is going to end up saying is that, in fact, meaning doesn't depend on reference and we can use Russell's theory of definite descriptions, which we'll get to, in order to show why that is. But I just want to get at this Plato's beard or the platonic riddle of non-being, because otherwise it'll seem kind of crazy that anyone would want to say that there has to be an entity for Pegasus. But the motivation is that otherwise, how do we ground the meaning of a word like Pegasus? So, for instance, someone might want to say, well, it refers to something in our imaginations, which, of course, doesn't work, because when we say Pegasus has wings, we don't mean that something in our imagination has wings. We mean the actual Pegasus. Right. We mean the actual, but not actual Pegasus <laughs> at the same time. The possible Pegasus, or however you want to put it. I kind of feel like Santa Claus is an intuitive example, because there are people, namely people who are under the age of four, who think that Santa Claus does exist. And you might walk up to one of them and say, actually, Santa Claus doesn't exist, and thus bursting mm -hmm. their bubble. So this is often referred to as the problem of negative existentials, what Quine calls Plato's beard. And maybe one sort of intuitive way to set that up is, so I come along and tell you Santa Claus doesn't exist. And then you might say, okay, well, what doesn't exist? Can you point to the thing doesn't exist? But of course you can't point to it. I mean, if you right. could point to it, it would exist. So like, what is it that you're saying doesn't exist? And trying to answer that question gets you into sort of a paradox. Yeah, it seems as if non-existence is a property that you would have to attribute paradoxically to some objects. Yeah, that exactly. Object that has to exist in order to have the property of not existing. Yeah, so you have the problem of the being of non-being. Yeah, so one route you might take, which is the route that the philosopher Alexius Minon took, is to say, well, you know, in some sense, there is Pegasus. It's just that he doesn't have the property of existing. He merely subsists instead of existing. You develop this third realm, as it were, of imaginary entities that don't exist but could exist or something. So that's one of the things that Quine is especially critical of and sort of gets this paper going. Is that the same as the possible worlds? If you think that there is Pegasus, only he doesn't exist... Maybe one way to spell that out would be to say that there is a possible world somewhere containing Pegasus, only it isn't the actual world. Right. But there might be other ways of spelling that out as well that don't involve possible worlds. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the central problem here is that we are having a conversation where we seem to meaningfully refer to Pegasus, but there's no Pegasus in the world that can be a referent, as it were, of that utterance. And so the dilemma here is, 
how can we actually be speaking meaningfully or be making meaningful statements?